morning, and welcome to worship at Lakeside Presbyterian Church. My name is Don Scott Carpenter, and I'm the organist, director of music, worship, and arts here at Lakeside. Our minister, the Reverend Chris Cellini, is still recuperating from a small medical procedure. We continue to send our thoughts and prayers, and he will be returning to the pulpit very soon. This morning, I welcome the Reverend Randy Young, who will deliver the sermon. Immediately following our worship this morning, please join us for our Zoom coffee hour. The link may be found in previous emails. The Lord be with you. Let us call ourselves to worship. As we gather this morning, be confident that the Lord is with you. He has called us that we may be where he is. Jesus is the path that leads to God. He is the certainty that leads to God. Jesus came as the way, the truth, and the life to protect us, to lead us, and to comfort us always. Let us worship God. join with me in the prayer of confession. Jesus said, nothing is hidden that will not be disclosed, nor is anything secret that will not come to light. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Dear Lord, we struggle in our lives with doubt, 
loneliness, and fear of the unknown. We look to other sources for answers to hard questions, to justify our actions and to seek comfort. Help us to remember that you alone are the source of all our needs. You guide us on the path that leads to joy. You teach us the real truth of life and death. You shine upon us and our lives. Forgive us when we doubt and when we trust, when our trust becomes questionable. Now take a moment of silent confession. Jesus tells us he wants to be with us always. He wants to comfort us. He promises that with him all our sins will be forgiven and his mercy will never cease. Thanks be to God. This morning's epistle lesson comes from the book of Romans. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set on the mind of flesh is death, but to set on the mind of spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of God does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit you put to death, that if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back on into fear but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. The word of the Lord. lesson this morning comes from John. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Randy Young, and it's my privilege to be here yet again, very unexpectedly. Uh, but I'm here to bring a word of good news to you. Uh, but before I do that, I want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer for your pastor, Chris Cellini, who is uh, having a tough time recovering from a procedure on his vocal cords. And I think it would be good for we as the community of, of God here at Lakeside to, to pray for him. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we are so grateful that you love us, that you care about us, that you have our best interests in mind. And now Lord, we want to lift Christianity up to you who is um, recovering a little more slowly uh, than expected for this procedure on his vocal cords. We pray, Lord, that as the great physician, that trusting that you can do it, and we ask that you will accelerate the healing process so that he will be healed sooner rather than later. And in the midst of this, that you will give Chris uh, a sense of your presence. We ask that you put him in the palm of your hand where he can know your presence and draw uh, from your love and power and wisdom for him. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who makes this possible. And the people of God said, Amen. This morning, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. I don't know him personally, but he is a person who has shaped who I am, shaped my thoughts, shaped my heart. It's a man by the name of Frederick Beekner. He's an author. He is a Presbyterian pastor as well. He was ordained at the Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church long, long ago. And in 1977, he wrote this wonderful little book called Telling the Truth, the gospel as tragedy, comedy, and fairy tale. And in it, he says this, the gospel is bad news before it is good news. It is the news that man is a sinner, to use the old word, that he is evil in the imagination of his heart, that when he looks down in the mirror, all in a lather, what he sees is at least eight parts chicken, phony slob. That's the tragedy. But it is also the good news that he is loved anyway, cherished, forgiven, bleeding to be sure, but also bled for. This is comedy. And yet forgiven when the very mark and substance of his sin and of his slobbery is that he keeps turning down the love and forgiveness because he either doesn't believe them or doesn't want them or just doesn't give a damn. We all know what bad news looks like. We know what it looks like in our own lives, oftentimes kept in the darkness uh, by our secrets. We know what it looks like in our country now, with the rioting on the streets of our cities and the rise of crime and homicide in those cities. We see leaders blaming one another while sidestepping their own responsibilities. We see media living into the journalistic principle if it bleeds, it leads, more times than not, 
scaring people more than informing us. We see the scientific and medical world struggle on how to deal with this pandemic called coronavirus. We see political leaders struggle with the social unrest that began with uh, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. We are told there are peaceful protests that look somewhat like riots. There are leaders who are calling for defunding the police. So in the face of all this bad news, uh, what's the good news? What is the good news of the gospel for us in this day? What is the good news that the Church of Jesus Christ has to offer that no other entity in our world has to offer? What do we bring to the table? The Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I believe that's true. I believe it's absolutely true. However, it's my observation that most people like the truth only when it's focused on other people, not ourselves. The calls for justice is wide and loud, but under close examination, it is a call for other people to pay the price, to pay the penalty, to bear the consequences for the injustice. Those people, those people deserve justice. Punish them for the wrong they have done. But when the focus of justice gets turned around and focuses on them, on me, the cries for justice disappears. It's, I've been around the ministry and the church for 40 years now, and I have never heard people say, give me justice, give me what I deserve. Punish me for the wrong I have done. When you are the object of justice, you don't want justice. You want mercy. Mercy becomes more important than justice. See, we don't really like hearing the truth, particularly when it's about us. Because truth reveals reality. The real me. The real you. And the real me and the real you is not as beautiful and nice as we like other people to think of us. I think about the young rich ruler who, in looking, trying to look good to others, asked Jesus what he needs to do to be saved. And he walked away with his head down because Jesus told him to sell all he had and then come follow him. I think about Ananias and Sapphira who tried to fraudulently show their, the early Christians how generous they were. They lied and they died for their sins, for their lie. I think about Nicodemus, a deeply devoted Jew, a Pharisee, a learned man who was dumbfounded when Jesus told him that he must be born again. What you understand as truth is not truth, what you believe is wrong and inadequate, there, there is much for you to learn, Nicodemus. The truth is that we don't really like hearing the truth about ourselves. Thomas Sowell is a 90-year-old man, turned 90 this year, who has worked all uh, for the last 40 years at the Hoover Institute just down the road in Palo Alto. He has written nearly 50 books, wonderful, insightful books, books with a point of view that provides a different kind of perspective and why I enjoy reading him. He has, said, he has said this, the reason so many people do not understand so many issues is not that these issues are so complex, but that people do not want a factual or analytical explanation that leaves them emotionally unsatisfied. Seems to me as I have lived my life and I'm getting towards the end of it, um, we live in a world in which self-esteem has become most important in life. How we view ourselves, how we feel about ourselves is ultimately what is important. And we are concerned about what other people see us. And as our emotional well-being has become so very important, 
it seems our egos have become more fragile. It's no wonder that the idea there are people who are snowflakes, so fragile that they need to be protected at all costs. We give out participation trophies that are really meaningless, but are for some reason emotionally satisfying. Blaming the president and the CDC for decisions you made is emotionally satisfying. Blaming schools for your lack of knowledge is emotionally satisfying. Blaming others for your predicament is emotionally satisfying. It seems to me we live in a day when comfort has become very important. We want to be comfortable. We don't want to be offended. We don't want people who think differently and value other things than us to voice their obviously wrong opinions. And so on Twitter um, or whatever social media you, they use, people are shamed and shunned, driven from participating in the public discourse by whatever social media, to the point where many people are losing their jobs. There's something emotionally satisfying about attacking others and shutting them down, but it does not get us to the truth and the truth that sets us free. During World War II, uh, before and after World War II, uh, there was a very interesting group of uh, authors who would meet on a weekly basis, and they called themselves the Inklings. They met on a weekly basis at a tavern uh, where they would uh, share their latest writings and receive the critique of their fellow um, authors. Two of the most notable authors were J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, and C.S. Lewis. And Owen Barfield, who was another member, said that they would discuss big ideas as well as uh, in pursuit of the truth, as well as their own writing. Owen Barfield says this about Inklings uh, and his own experience. Compared arguing to, with Lewis to will, excuse me, Owen Barfield compared arguing with Lewis to wielding a pea shooter against a howitzer. It must be understood that rational opposition is not quarreling. We were always arguing for truth, not for victory. Arguing for truth and not comfort. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And if we will pursue truth, we will probably end up being comforted. But if we pursue comfort, we will get neither truth or comfort. The truth is, is that we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have not lived up to God's expectations. We prefer to blame others for our bad behavior. It seems that our world has fallen into seeking a political or governmental solution for what is essentially a spiritual problem. And as the world has turned away from God, the world has gravitated to politics in such a way that politics has become a religion of sorts. Government has become a, uh, a church of sorts. But when we face a spiritual problem, a problem of the heart, a problem of the soul, the only solution for that problem is God, the God of creation, the God of life, the God of redemption, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is truth. The truth comes from God. The truth draws us to God. The truth draws us to Jesus. That truth draws us into a living, loving relationship with Jesus Christ, the living God. I know that I'm probably sounding like an old-fashioned, old, out-of-touch old, out fundamentalist uh, with a one-track mind where Jesus is the answer to everything. And I'm here to tell you uh, that's not me, really. I know that two plus two, the answer to that is not Jesus, it's four. But the answer to the problems we face is Jesus. As a follower of Jesus and as a church leader, what I am focused on and what I will always put at the forefront 
is the thing that we have to offer that no one else can offer. And that is the God who loves you in spite of your sin. The gospel is full of stories of people, ordinary people like you and like me, who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. There are people from all walks of life, dairymen, a grocer, a trucker, a teacher, a policeman, a fireman, analysts, managers, inventors, marketers, salesmen, moms and dads. There are ordinary people like you and me, like Cornelius the centurion that Peter met in Acts chapter 10. Peter tells the centurion about Jesus Christ and how he can be saved. Many per people heard that gospel. Those people heard speaking, uh, they heard people speaking in tongues. They heard about a new life in Christ and were baptized. And nothing more, nothing else. Nothing about going back to Rome and changing the system. I think about Lydia, the businesswoman who sold purple cloth, who heard the gospel that she is loved by God and forgiven, promised a loving relationship with Jesus. Nothing more, nothing else. Nothing about changing the economic system. I think about the jailer who, keeping watch over Paul and Silas, when there was a great earthquake and the doors were open and the chains fell off, and he was frightened by the possible consequence of losing his prisoners. He asked, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. That's it. Nothing more, nothing else. Nothing about changing the judicial system. I think about Titius, Justice, and Crispus, the synagogue leader who came to believe in Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing about changing the synagogue. In this time of darkness and chaos, there is this temptation to follow the crowd, to behave badly, to give in to our darker selves, to yell and scream, to slander and protest, to loot and burn, to vent our frustration in inappropriate ways. In the letter from Paul to the Romans that was read earlier, in chapter 8, it says this beginning with verse 5. Those who, be, who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in, in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. That's what we have to offer. That's what we are given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Herein lies the opportunity before us. We could live into our sinful nature, or we could live into the calling that God calls us to as a follower of Jesus Christ. During this time in which life is different, we have a lot of excess time that we didn't know we had because we aren't permitted to do other things. It's a really a, a wonderful opportunity to reflect and ponder, to take a very close look, a hard look at the condition of our own hearts. What is it that God wants to do in my own life? What is the next step of discipleship for me? What part of my life do I need to turn over to God? Maybe it is the fear you have about our world. Maybe it is the fear of getting sick with COVID or any other disease. Maybe it is the low-grade constant panic attack that leads me to live in this constant state of stress. Maybe it's the angst over something, the unsettling tension in my heart that causes loss of sleep. Maybe it's realizing how far away I have drifted from God, not worshiping, not praying, not listening for His guidance by reading the Bible. Maybe it's realizing I'm living as a functional atheist, even though I say I, I believe in God and follow Jesus. Maybe it's realizing that I am more afraid of what the world thinks of me than what I am 
afraid of God, what God thinks of me. Maybe it's renewing our trust in Jesus and what he has to say to us, recognizing that the truth is scary and a little unsafe. C.S. Lewis in The Chronicles of Narnia um, wrote this about a girl who goes into this magical world called Narnia. She hears the story from Mr. Beaver about the Christ figure, a great lion named Aslan. She becomes really concerned about meeting the great lion, and so she asks, is he safe? Safe, says Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. God isn't safe, but he is good. And he looks out for us. And he wants the best for us. So how's the gospel fairy tale? We often think a fairy tale as being fictitious stories of make-believe, that they don't really exist. But the gospel fairy tale is very real. As real as the sun that warms the earth, as the rain that nourishes uh, the planet, the air that we breathe. In today's world, in which we hear so much about justice, about righting the wrongs, God offers the inexplicable gift of mercy, what we all want when the focus is on us. It makes no sense why God would reduce the sentence for our sin against him and humanity, and also expunge the record and pay the penalty himself. It makes no sense, but it is real nevertheless. And it gives us great relief, an internal, deeply satisfying peace, a peace that passes understanding, because it doesn't make sense. And that is fairy tale. Let me reread Beekner at the begin what I read at the beginning, but finish with what he also said. At the beginning, he said. The gospel is bad news before it is good news. It is the news that man is a sinner, to use the old word, that he is evil in the imagination of his heart, that when he looks in the mirror all in a lather, what he sees is at least eight parts chicken, phony slob. That is the tragedy. But it is also the news that he is loved anyways, cherished, forgiven, Bleeding to be sure, but also bled for. That is comedy. And yet forgiven when the very mark and substance of his sin and of his slobbery is that he keeps turning down the love and forgiveness because he either, he either does, doesn't believe them or doesn't want them or just doesn't give a damn. Beekner finishes by saying this. In answer, the good news of the gospel is that extraordinary things happen. Henry Ward Beecher cheats on his wife, his God himself, but manages to keep on bringing the gospel to life for people anyway, maybe even for himself. Lear goes berserk on a heath, but comes out of it for a few brief hours every inch a king. Zacchaeus climbs up a sycamore tree, a crook, and climbs down a saint. Paul sets out a hatchet man for the Pharisees and comes back a fool for Christ. It is impossible for anybody to leave behind the darkness of the world he carries on his back like a snail. But for God, all things are possible. That is fairy tale. And all together, they are the truth. O oh Lord our God, we trust that you have spoken to us. Help us to allow you to touch us, to move us, to change us, to disciple us, to live into your calling, and to be light to the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
let us affirm our faith together, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. <clears throat> God of all hope, our lives have changed in ways we could never have imagined possible, but our faith in you remains strong. There is so much to pray for and much to be thankful for. We pray for those who are hospitalized or in quarantine and ask that you would continue to rest your healing hand upon them. We pray for the nurses and doctors who put their lives on the line so that others may live. Bless them in their work. Give them times of rest and time spent with you. We thank you for those who have recovered. We pray for those who mourn the loss of their loved ones and ask that you would bring them comfort and peace. We pray for those who have lost their jobs, whose businesses have closed, who struggle to make ends meet, who are hungry and lonely, that they would be strengthened by the prayers of others and know that they are not alone because you are walking with them through this journey. We are thankful for the outpouring of love by people from all works of life who provide food, clothing, and other essentials, who make phone calls, and who send card to those in need. Bless these your servants in their work and bless those whom they serve. We are thankful for being able to meet the challenges of finding new ways of bringing one another together online with worship services and Zoom meetings. We are thankful for the scientists who are busy working on a vaccine to cure COVID-19 and in the process are discovering medicines which can be used in the treatment of other diseases. We pray for our church, its staff, and congregation as we continue this journey together. May we cling to your promises. Give us strength, understanding, and patience, remembering that in your time, this too will pass. These things I pray in the one constant and essential in our lives, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Truly God has blessed us with the rich, varied, and abundant gifts of creation. From God's abundance, let us also give abundantly. During this time of pandemic, we still need your generosity to ensure the presence of Lakeside in our community and in our world. You may send a check to the church or visit our website, Lakeside Presbyterian Church sf.org to make your contribution. Lord, during this time where people are struggling to make ends meet, we thank you for the gifts 
and donations sent by those, whether they be great or small, so that the work of Lakeside may continue in our community and our world, and that others may be helped by our generosity. These things I pray in your strong name. Amen. Now take this word of benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we all we can ask or imagine, according to the work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>